Hello then, everyone, and welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Enfield Voices. And this is one of the many webinars that we do that look at big issues. And today we're going to look at what's called community mapping, which is how you identify all the groups and the interests in a local area so that people know exactly where they are, how they connect with each other, and how they can get a, a richer community. And we've got Cormac Russell with us today, who is one of Europe's biggest experts on what's called asset-based community development, or ABCD for short, which is a way in which you can make that, that social map stronger by giving it the substance of bringing the strengths, gifts, the skills and the gifts that groups have to work together to each other so that they can be stronger together. So Cormac, thank you for joining us. And Emma Rigby is here with us today and she's gonna help with the interviewing because Emma is actually starting a community mapping project in the London Borough of Enfield. Anyhow, Cormac, let's start. Maybe we could start by you telling us a bit about yourself and your mission to develop asset-based community development. Sure, well, first of all, Francis and Emma, it's good to be with you. Um, so I am a faculty member of a, an institute based in Chicago, and it's called the Asset Based Community Development Institute. And uh, we're very much interested in small bounded places, neighborhoods, small towns, villages, uh, and how the people who live there can use what they have to secure what they collectively want. Uh, so a way of thinking about that is, is we're interested in supporting people to discover, connect and mobilize their assets. Um, that's probably enough for now, Francis. I don't want to take up too much of your time. OK, and Emma, would you like to tell us a bit about your community mapping exercise and what you're planning to do there? Sure. Um, really nice to meet you, Cormac. I've heard such great things sure. about the work that you're doing. Um, just really quickly, a bit of background. A lot of you may know that we held a youth crime public meeting in January of this year. And we had some great panelists at that meeting um, and a packed out audience uh, full of people across Enfield that were particularly concerned or willing to contribute to the issue of youth crime. Now, something that came out of that meeting was the fact that there were so many small community organizations out there all trying to do the same thing and all trying to you know, um, help in this area of youth crime, but we had never kind of met them before. So one of the things that I promised the audience that evening was that I would at some point map out our borough. So that's where we're at at the moment and it came about, um, it came about more uh, since COVID hit and Love Your Doorstep headed up the community response for COVID um, and the pandemic across Enfield. And I had a large technology company approach me by the name of Arup. And um, Arup wanted to help us. Um, they wanted to help with volunteers actually. And I said, look, we have got ample volunteers. We've got ample people helping, but I do need some help on the technology front. And I was wondering if you might help us map our borough. So they have um, set up this project as a community project. Um, and I've been working with them now for quite a while. So yeah, um, probably two months. So it'd be really interesting to hear what you've got to say today, Cormac. Okay, Cormac, uh, you, you have um, uh, recently published a book, haven't you, which is called Rekindling Democracy, Professional's Guide to Working in Citizen Space. Um, is that what community engagement and community mapping is? It's about working in a particular space. It is. Well, you know, if you, if, if you think about a neighbourhood, a place where people live, and you think about the scale of that, it tends to be very small and it tends to be local. And what we're certainly in the book or in work generally, what, what I'm really interested in is, first of all, how local residents can join together. We, we saw in the pandemic that the uh, pandemic had an effect of precipitating people and galvanizing people into action, neighbor to neighbor at street level. They became the first responders. The street became the uh, primary locus of response. 
That wasn't borough wide. It's, it's really important to say that was neighborhood wide. It just happened that it was uh, kind of a federation of neighborhoods in Enfield. And through certain lenses, you might say that's borough wide or that's UK wide or that's worldwide or whatever it might be. But these expressions tend to be, I love that expression ever used. Um, around the doorstep, close to people's doorstep, because that tends to be the threshold at which people engage and respond, neighbor to neighbor. So the book is, when I talk about rekindling democracy, it's a very simple idea that uh, a citizen isn't somebody who's crouched over kindling, waiting for somebody else to light their fire. They're actually engaged with their neighbors collectively to do things. And, and this is something that happened during, I believe anyway, during uh, COVID, almost like a hydraulic relationship. As the capacity of institutions started to go down, the response of non-institutional people might call them citizens in civic space started to go up. Now, it's interesting that as the capacity of professionals started to go up and institutions started to increase post lockdown, we're starting to actually see the receding of a lot of the mutuality and the citizen response. And the danger here is, is that it starts to become commodified and professionalized again. And that's as much a danger um, on the, like it, it, there may be third sector organizations who could fall into that trap as much as um, public sector. So I'm really interested in the distinction between neighbors and local small associations that don't have any formal structures mm -hmm. may not even think of themselves as a group they're so informal and what they did during COVID and how they responded because they won't appear on a directory of services or clubs mm -hmm. or groups but in my mind they are as important to democratic life to well-being to economic development uh, and I would say more important actually than an awful lot of the more formal institutions. Now, typically asset maps that I've seen have tended to count what's countable and it's easy to count the organizations and the formal groups. But if we could drive it even more local and into the more informal space, that's where the engine room of people power change is to be found in my view. Emma? Well, I really, I totally agree with you on that. We've seen the most phenomenal work um, from neighbors just people in our community during this dreadful time that we've all been going through um, and something we'll never forget. And I really hope um, that we don't forget it. So much good has come out of such a terrible time as well. But um, one of the questions I had for you was, do you feel it's a great way to do collaborative working um, and learn from each other? But I think you've pretty much answered that for me. Um, but I'd love to, if you could, keep going on that a little bit more about the experience that you've had and how people have learnt mm -hmm. um, from the work you've done? Well, I think if we could go onto every street in, in, in Enfield and we could say to people, could you tell us stories about how you got together to make things better during the last, whatever, 24 weeks, particularly uh, in March and April, and who were the people who helped you gather together in the local space, in, in citizen space, in your local community? Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be really interesting because then you could sit with them and they would probably tell, tell you more stories. Um, and I think out of that, you could begin to really discover almost what's invisible, because I think that's the big challenge with asset mapping. It's, and it might even be better to think about because the map is never the territory, right? So what we're trying to do is create a dynamic portrait of what typically is invisible. You know, in a sense, maps make the invisible visible and negotiable. You know, we can, we can begin to move with meaning around. So we can say, well, on that street, there are 15 people and five of them know how to be useful when somebody is dying at home and the services can't reach them. Mm. And they, they, they feel comfortable to um, be with somebody to the end of life, for example. That information is really critical if somebody, for example, can't, during a lockdown, get to a service or they choose to die at home, um, which is a bit of a, you know, um, a hard subject to uh, bring to light. But actually, 
that's exactly what some communities, including my community, had to do on a couple of occasions during the end of uh, the the end of um, April, particularly, and it happened in Spain as well. Uh, in fact, in Spain, near the mid part of April, I can't remember the exact date, but there was a period of about three, four days in our work where we were hearing reports of older people being found dead in their homes. Wow! So you know, this is quite grim, and. It, you know, as you go country to country, some of our work in, in Africa and some African countries where COVID doesn't even hit the top 10 killers, you know, so you, the complexity of this is, is really, it's heartbreaking. But what we're interested in discovering is what are the invisible resources and capacities and passions that exist within any given community and how might we surface them? Now, one of the things that we've found in our own community work is, is that you might discover that there's something four or five people would like to do to make things better. It might be that there isn't anything for young girls to do in their yeah. community and they're concerned about that. And I think one of the things that asset-based community development would in, I suppose, invite people to consider is there's an, an almost unstated reflexive behavior in modern industrial society, right? So it goes a little like this. We say there's a problem. There's nothing for young girls to do in our neighborhood. And the reflexive behavior is to immediately default into an assumption and the assumption is what we need is we need a youth service to sort that out. So we then do a map of all the youth services or all the services who might do something for young people. Um, and then we sit down with the young people and we say, well, let's look at all of these and say, which one would meet your need? So that, and, and most people would hear that and say, well, what's wrong with that? We're so schooled in thinking that that's the way you do things that we would just do it reflexively. Now, there's another way of approaching that. And it is to sit with the young people and the local people and say, okay, so you're saying that there's nothing for young girls to do around here. Okay, well, let's have a conversation about what are the local resources that exist around here that if we join them up more productively would address that issue. You know, and it might be that uh, one of the girls says, well, you know, the big problem around here is not so much that there's nothing for people people my age to do, but it's that everybody thinks this is a crappy place to live. And if you're young and you have any aspiration, your aspiration is to get out of this neighborhood as quickly as possible. Um, and the only way to feel safe or to wear a badge of honor is to carry a weapon. Right? So now we're coming back you're going, home, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, yeah, well, you're going so it's deeper just, and deeper into yeah, the yeah. social issues. Exactly. And mm. uh, um, and then another girl pipes up and says, yeah, well, it's 46% unemployment in my neighborhood. Most people around here don't work. And say, so what's it like growing up with the story that says that there are no productive adults in your neighborhood? And somebody else pipes up and says, hang on, there's 54% of people who do work or volunteer and there's great people. And suddenly the invisible is becoming visible now. Mm. And so you get to a point where you say, well, what would happen if those 54% of people were prepared to bring uh, one young person a day to work, you know, what would happen then? And so you're starting not just to map the assets now, but what you're doing is you're discovering, connecting, and mobilizing them productively. And this is the piece. Mapping isn't an action step. Mapping just kind of, it's a nice way of, setting out the table, <laughs> but it's mm. not the dinner. You know, it's, it, it, we have to sit, we have to connect, we have to prepare, we have to eat. So I think what I've just described to you, I would say is community building of which asset mapping is a tool. The, um, I mean, in a way it, it sounds a bit like, I don't know if you read it, Hilary Cotton's work in Radical Help, which is about creating relationships. You go beyond that and you create relationships. And in a way, you say that, don't you, in your book, where you say um, that um, the, uh, the development, um, like, like uh, all the things that we're talking about, um, has got to be done by the community, mm -hmm. even before the professionals get at it. And I think you made that point very strong. So what you're saying, are you, that it's got to be bottom up, it's got to be done at that community level, not top down. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so I think you have to probably really think deeply about who is actually doing the asset mapping. That I think the neighborhood is the primary unit of change, not Enfield or not the borough, but neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood. And that how do we get to a point where local people who are not driving a single issue, but actually care about the whole neighborhood can hold on to the asset mapping process uh, or feel some sense of ownership of the data, for example. Uh, so it, it feels like their fingerprints are all over that. That's, that's one of the bigger challenges, I think. How would you go about combining asset-based community development with community mapping? Hmm. I think a very simple way to think about it, Emma, is to just bring it back to ourselves as human beings and to think about when are we more likely to uh, act, uh, you know, to take action on something. And it tends to be when we care about it. You know, if I care deeply about litter, for example, I'm more likely to get up and pick up the litter on my street. Um, so so I, I think the first step is to do something that gets past opinion and gets into motivation. Now, if I say I'm, I'm really passionate about doing something around litter, then the next question might be, well, what resources do I have to help me do that? Now, this is where an asset map could be really useful. So I say, okay, you know, I'm somebody living in a neighborhood. I really care about litter. And then somebody says, well, there's four other people just like you who live in door knocking distance and I can connect you with them. Great. That's, uh, that's helpful. Um, and then there may be other assets that are local that I don't have to write a funding application or I don't have to jump through hoops to get to. Uh, so what I would call primary assets, which are local and within my control. Uh, incidentally, it might be useful to categorize assets into primary, which are local and within my control. Secondary, which are local, but not in my control. And the classic one would be a school that doesn't allow the community to have access to the grounds and to the building. In other words, the resource is solely for the mission of the school rather than as an asset for the community. So it's local, but it's not within community control. Community centers that are governed by people who don't like children, for example, or young people, and it does happen, sadly, um, would be another example. It's a local asset. On paper, I could read the asset map and say, wonderful, they've got 10 community centers but nine of them aren't open to young people, um, you know, and boast the best CCTV cameras you've ever seen. The third category is external assets. So they're neither local nor in community control. Community building is constantly trying to at least begin the conversation with what you have locally that you can begin to tap into so that you grow energy, you go, grow momentum, you grow a sense of we have influence over our lives here. We can start with things and really beginning to prioritize those things uh, to build momentum and you know, capacity. Uh, so I think I would start by finding out what people care about enough to act upon and then begin dynamically the process of asset mapping. So you could have your asset map now, for example, and then you could begin a listing campaign, sorry, uh, you could begin a listening, it's okay, a listening campaign <clears throat> uh, where you begin maybe a door knocking exercise or you find a few really good connectors locally who are prepared to have 100 conversations at street level uh, to really find out what people's passions are, what they care about, what will get them up in the morning, what keeps them awake at night, you know, um, what do they enjoy doing? I love the question, if three of your neighbors were willing to help you, what would you love to do? Right. Can, 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 can I say, cool, like listening to you, I mean, when I look at how Emma's doing it, I mean, what you say is important and that is how you sort of carry on doing it. But to start, I think what Emma's doing, and Emma can comment on this as well, is to, first of all, identify what's there, to find the groups, that's stage one. Stage two, then, is to do what you said, to look at how you can find their strengths, how you can bring them together, how you can identify problems. Do you think that's going about it the right way? Because, you know, community mapping is set up to identify, but asset-based development is a process that goes beyond that. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> there's no wrong door in, as long as you don't get stuck. 
Mm. Right. Um, so um, I, I know how to do the work well enough now that I could start just with community building um, and just dynamically, very simply, just employ community builders in every neighborhood and they would dynamically create the maps. Um, I know other people who started as Emma started, but got stuck there. And people resisted doing the community building because they said, well, we've done the work. There's a map and nothing happened. So what you really have to do is manage your messaging here and say that the map is not an action step. It doesn't change anything. It just gives us a picture uh, of the territory and of the possibilities. But we now need to sit down and have the possibility conversation. And it needs to be hyper-local. So, um, I love yeah, that word. That's no, my favorite no word. Intro. What's that? I've, I've never heard anyone else use that word. That's my favorite word. Hyper-local. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it comes under so many things for me. Yeah. But, um, no, that's amazing advice. Thank you. Not at all. So, you know, there's no wrong, there's no wrong way into this, Francis, but while you may go, it, these are entry points. So what I think Emma's very skillfully um, created is a really powerful entry point uh, into a conversation. She's kind of created a banquet table, but now we have to just make sure that each of the corners is broken into bite-sized chunk, a neighborhood chunk, and that that work is done as well. Otherwise, what you'll have is a really cool map, and it sounds like it's going to be great, especially with the help of a route and whatnot. But the danger is the more technologically sophisticated it becomes, the more shiny and accomplished it looks, and the more people will go either, well, that's work done, great, you know, we now have a list. And after all, don't lists make things change? I've never come across one that has. Mm. Um, and uh, also people, I think, look at technologically accomplished things and think, I'm not really up to this. So the other thing to manage is, is that this doesn't overwhelm people or make people who feel I'm not credentialed enough uh -huh. uh, feel that they can't bring their gifts and their contributions to the table. So you end up with lots and lots of institutional and professionalized people coming to the party, fixing problems rather than citizens sharing gifts. That, I mean, Emma, maybe you could, you know, let Cormac and the rest of us know, you know, how you are going through and how you're developing the identification process. You're finding those groups, first of all, within a neighborhood. Yeah, I think um, everything you've said just resonates with me so much because Love Your Doorstep, my organization was set up. Um, it's a community-based organization. Um, all my staff live locally. Uh, we run the largest community forum here in the borough and day in and day out, we're helping local people find local products and services. So we've been around for a long time and we've got some really good relationships. And I think um, that was how we were able to pull together the community response for COVID so well. Um, and like I said that, you know, it's just been incredible to work on and for with these people. But what you just said about it um, looking a bit shiny and not becoming too commercialized is exactly what I'm not going for. So that's good to hear. Um, this is about any, everyone from kind of poet groups to scout huts to brownie groups um, to all our different um, cultures that, that we have here in Enfield, being able to have a presence somewhere um, and us being able to communicate and work together. And um, yeah, I mean, that's my vision for it, is that it'll involve everyone. And I think um, with the type of personality I have, um, that shines through in what Love Your Doorstep's about anyway, is that we try and bring in as many types of people as we can, um, to make it a diverse community. And uh, Cormac, I mean, just to say, I think mean, Emma and I are going in sort of parallel directions. I mean, we've started up a, uh, a network called Enfield Climate Action Forum, which has 70 organisations in it. Now, what advice would you give us to, for example, on an issue like that, which, you know, does uh, make people locally concerned? How would you move that from being a network of 70 organisations to be one that was based upon asset development principles? I think the biggest um, challenge for any of us, 
in in coming together as human beings is is that we actually act like we like each other um rather than we're just suffering each other in order to solve a problem mm -hmm. so the biggest thing um that we have available to us is intimate community relations you know so the idea that community is a verb it's not a noun um, I'm really struck by the number of meetings that you go to and they're set up even online in such a way that the one thing you don't do is actually fall in love with each other. You don't actually get excited by each other. You don't experience any joy together. I'm not saying that your groups do this, but the groups get to such a scale and they get to such a point that there's, you know, it's almost like this is the cross to bear, you know? And um, I think one of the things I would say is, Let's find a way of being convivial, of being in deep relationship with each other. And just on this, I think there are three things that really matter. And I just put it into the chat for, for everybody. Um, I don't know if the um, attendees can see the chat. Yeah. Good. So I think in every group and in every community, beginning to think about assets in these terms is important so that in every group, in every community, every person, regardless of their label, even if they're a bit challenging in their behavior, um, everybody has a gift to bring. And, and bring that ethos into your network is really important, taking it really seriously, but actually doing some work to discover what those gifts are. Because often even the members of the group won't know that they're allowed to bring their gifts. <laughs> they may think they can bring their grievance or they can bring a professional idea or bring a certain persona but that you, you actually want you to bring your gifts and that there's no gift that is surplus to demand, you know, and nobody that is surplus to demand. So I think the measure of a successful group is not its leadership, but the depth of its associational life and its ability to welcome the stranger at the edge. This, by the way, is really important. The success of responding to COVID is not how many people we fed or how many prescriptions we collected, right? I mean, this, in some mutual aid groups, it, it almost looked like they had been colonized by feeders, right? The success, I mean, in fact, it got so bizarre that there were people receiving food and receiving prescriptions that weren't even theirs or they didn't want. So we need to be careful here as well that there can be a huge amount of rescuing and a huge amount of fixing. But when we actually kind of lift off this, uh, you know, we're fixing all of the vulnerable people and rescuing all to, we see everybody is valuable. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has knowledge. Everybody has skills and everybody has passions. What are they? Let's discover them. And I think within this as well, the great power, say, of a group where you have 70 people who each bring all of that is as an association, it's like an association of associations. So how does that association of associations begin to coexist? You know, I think a really important question. We often say, oh, all 70 associations have to agree on one thing. You know, really? <laughs> well, well, maybe there's another way of thinking about that. It's, it's saying, okay, when we think about the different associations, how are things going in your neighborhood or in the neighborhoods you work in? And how might we as a group of 70 associations begin to support an association of associations in every neighborhood? So we don't just have residence associations or just one mutual aid group, but we're able to bring the, um, the, 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 the walking club and the mother and toddler group with the mutual aid group together so that they create some kind of an association of associations. And I think as well, there will be institutions mixed in there. So how do we invite the institutions to start using their resource to build community rather than using their resource to grow a client base or to grow a funding um, proposal? Because I think this often is what happens. You know, the groups kind of get to a point. They say, OK, this is great. We're over the crisis now. Let's find the next mission or the next problem and let's write a funding application. And I think if you can manage to keep a group of 70 people actually focused on building community within and building community uh, in their neighborhoods, you might be onto something. Well, no, I mean, I, I think that's great. I mean, we've got, we were pretty well close to the end of our half hour anyhow. And I think you've given Emma a lot of thought and me a lot of thought. And I think that's really useful. But if anybody, Cormac, wanted to find out more about your work and what you do and how you can help, how do they get in touch with you? Well, I can, I can leave my details 
with you, Francis, and it's just a matter really of uh, email. I'm also on Twitter, and it's just simply my name, at Cormac, C-O-R-M-A-C, Russell. Um, our website is nurture, N-U-R-T-U-R-E, development.org. Um, and there's quite a lot of material information there as well. Lots of videos, uh, lots of free material. So we're pretty, um, we're pretty much out there. And um, if people are interested at all, I've um, written a book that Francis very kindly mentioned, um, and that's on the shelves at the moment, called Rekindling Democracy, a Professional's Guide to Working in Citizen Space. So it's very much speaking to how you can show up if you're a paid professional in a way that builds community um, rather than builds a client base. You know, so my basic argument is, is that we have had an inversion of democracy since the Marshall Plan and the New Deal, which has meant that the role of citizens is kind of being defined as that which happens after the professional's work is done. And what I want to contend on that is, is that actually in a democracy, it needs to be the other way around. It's like Emma's work. It's that the role of the professional is defined as that which happens after the important work of citizens is done. That will reduce burnout among professionals and it will actually strengthen and rekindle democracy. So I think that's what we're talking about really tonight. Okay. And Emma, you've started on this long journey now of social mapping. But, uh, you know, if anybody wanted to help you out because you do have so much work to do and they wanted to contact you and find out what you're doing, how would they go about it? Um, they can contact me via the Love Your Doorstep website or um, you can follow me on Twitter. Emma lives, I am, on Twitter. Um, but also, we will be involving so many people over the course of this journey. So we've got like a phase one kind of group that we're working with, which includes um, some of our very local charity organisations that I've been working with through COVID. And um, phase two, we'll, we'll be going out to a huge group of people. Um, so yeah, we're just going to take it one step at a time and see where this journey leads us. Okay, well, I mean, thank you, Cormac, for doing that. And thanks for joining us, Emma. But I think, Cormac, that's been really, really useful because what you said at the beginning, I think it's really important. When you start on a project, which is quite glossy, like social mapping, and people love the idea, sometimes people don't get further than having the dots on the map. Um, to be able to take it further, to build the relationships, not necessarily to fall in love with each other, that could be a bit dangerous, but to build relationships um, is pretty vital. And I think you've helped us a lot today in talking about how you can do that, how you can look at the assets that both people and groups and associations have, and how you can then use those to make a, a, a richer community. So thank you really for joining us today. I think it's been very Enjoy. useful. And maybe we can keep in touch with you so that you can maybe advise us as the social mapping develops and hopefully goes into that acid-based development phase as well. So thank you for doing this. And thanks for um, joining us, Emma, telling us about the social mapping and helping with the interviewing as always. So thank you. And uh, you know, we'll, end, we'll end this uh, webinar interview now. Thank <laughs> you.